All right, we're talking Seattle Seahawks football on the Arleds Football Network, uh, the Arleds Football YouTube channel. Uh, I'm Greg De Palma, and of course, joining me anytime we talk Seattle Seahawks football, it's Corbin Smith of the Locked On Seahawks podcast. How's it going, Corbin? Good, Greg. Thanks for having me, as always. Oh, it's great to have you on again. That means, of course, uh, usually a couple of things. NFL draft time, which is great around April because what else is there to do? And, of course, most importantly, the NFL season is around the corner, which it is, which is even better. So how are the fans uh, getting ready for this upcoming season with their new head coach? Well, I think that there really is a palpable excitement that has not been in the Pacific Northwest for a few years. And that's not taking a knock at Pete Carroll. He's the best coach in franchise history, led the Seahawks to 10 playoff appearances, two Super Bowls, incredible personality. But I think everything has an expiration date. And the last couple of years, it just felt like things were not working the way they had the first 10, 11 years that Pete Carroll's head coach. It seemed like some things got away from him. And last year, there were a few games late in the season where it felt like there were some players that kind of gave up on the field. And we had never seen that with Pete Carroll on the sidelines. So there is a different kind of excitement now with Mike McDonald coming in. The players seem to love him. They are buying into what he's selling. The fans are certainly buying into what Mike McDonald and Ryan Grubb, the new offensive coordinator, are selling with this young team that's got a lot of talent pieces trying to get that defense over the hump. And I just think some of the moves that they have made to try to solidify, particularly the defense and just the way that Mike McDonald carries himself. It's a totally different situation than Pete Carroll, but he knows how to get it done his way. And certainly doesn't look like a first time head coach. We'll see what things look like results wise on the field, but he does not look like somebody who has not done this before. Yeah, uh, definitely big adjustment. But it's also kind of interesting because not many head coaches today are defensive coaches. So you go from Pete Carroll, defensive coach, to another defensive coach. But it's almost like this is, uh, in a way, this is like mini Pete. Uh, not, of course, in the way that Pete used to just, even at, you know, at, those, at that young age, used to just, which he still did at an old age, run around the sideline, run around the, the sidelines, and you know, act like a fan, which is always great. It was fun. Uh, and it was still fun when he was older, too, I guess, to a point. But uh, it's kind of interesting. Now they go to a much younger version, I guess you can say. Uh, but Mike McDonald made sure uh, to have himself uh, as many uh, as many people on the staff, at least one significant one that could help him out that's been around, around for a while, and that is Leslie Frazier. Talk a little bit about uh, how much you think Leslie Frazier is going to impact uh, McDonald as a coach. There may not have been a more important hire that was made by Mike McDonald to this coaching staff. And in the sense, you know, Ryan Grubb, I think, is going to be a fantastic offensive coordinator. I loved that addition. But Ryan Grubb has never coached in the NFL. True. They haven't had their their defensive coordinator by title. Adam Durde is not going to be calling plays. Mike McDonald is. But Adam Durde has never been a defensive coordinator. There's a lot of really inexperienced coaches, at least in the capacity of of what they are coaching at the level they are coaching. But Leslie Frazier has been around the league for more than 25 years as an assistant coach. He's been a head coach in the league. He's been one of the best defensive coordinators for multiple teams in Minnesota, most recently Buffalo. Buffalo's defense slipped off a little bit after he was let go and the two sides split up. So you're bringing in a guy that has been in multiple roles as an NFL coach and done well in those roles. He's respected by his fellow coaches, he's respected by players, and obviously he brings the playing experience to the table as well with a really good NFL career. So to me, that was the most important hire. Mike McDonald had to bring somebody in that could help him as he learns the ropes as a head coach because he's never been a head coach at any level, let alone the NFL. So you've got to have somebody that has that experience that has been around the block a few times, and Leslie Frazier certainly has. So I think this has been a critical addition, and he is going to be somebody that Mike McDonald is going to be leaning on heavily this year as he adjusts to being a head coach for the first time. Okay, let's go ahead and take a look at the depth chart, and uh, and then we can kind of break down uh, the team, of course, uh, the Arlads depth chart. And uh, let's start on defense. So, again, this is Mike McDonald's defense. Uh, talk a little bit about uh, the, the major differences uh, from this year to last year. Well, you got to start at linebacker first and foremost because no longer have Bobby Wagner roaming in the middle. Jordan Brooks is now in Miami. This is a totally revamped linebacking core. 
Jerome Baker's been banged up for most of training camp, so there's still some question marks as far as what he's going to look like in this defense. He's been a good player when healthy, uh, but get out to see what he looks like out there on the practice or on the game field. Haven't seen much of him out there in training camp. Didn't play it all in the preseason. And Tyrell Dodson has 15 starts to his name in Buffalo. Last year was the most he's ever started, 10 games, replacing Matt Milano. Showed some really good, positive flashes, but again, relatively inexperienced. So you've got some question marks there behind those guys. There's like 20 snaps on defense in the regular season combined on the entire depth chart. So the Seahawks have a very young, inexperienced linebacking core. Fourth round pick Tyrese Knight, maybe the one that's the most intriguing in terms of long-term upside. They like Drake Thomas, the second-year linebacker out of North Carolina State as well. He just came off the pup list a few weeks ago from a severe knee injury that he suffered last year. Looks healthy, he's moving well. But that is really the biggest question mark on this defense because it's all new look. The most experienced player that they had returning, John Radigan, was claimed off waivers by Carolina earlier this week. So it just became an even less experienced group overall that Mike McDonald is going to have to coach up in his first season at the helm. And it's safety. No more Quandre Diggs, no more Jamal Adams. Instead, you bring in positional flexible safeties in Rayshon Jenkins as well as Kayvon Wallace to go with Julian Love. All three of those guys can play both safety positions. A couple of those guys can play slot corner in a pinch. So it allows this complex scheme that Mike McDonald runs with a lot of post-snap changes, pre-snap disguises. Having players that can play multiple positions makes that much easier to be able to open up your playbook. So those are really the two positions that have changed the most in terms of personnel to go with what Mike McDonald wants to do. They've brought back most of their D-line. Leonard Williams is back. Jaron Reed's back. Draymond Jones is back. Chenna Nuosu's back. Boy, Mafe's back. But they did add a massive nose tackle in Jonathan Hankins, who they lacked last year. They didn't have a guy over 320 pounds in the middle. He is going to give some much-needed girth and, and strength in the middle of that defensive line. And, of course, I'd be remiss not to mention Byron Murphy the second, who – Looks every bit as good as advertised. There's just certain dudes that you see on a practice field. Like, that guy is just different. Byron Murphy II is one of those guys. Just incredibly athletic, high motor, really elite burst for a player that's around 300 pounds. And I've made the comp to John Randall, and I'm not going to shy away from that. That is the player that I see right now when I watch Byron Murphy II on the practice field. And you expect Murphy, because every rookie, they uh, enter the league. They all enter the league the same, but they don't develop the same do you, no matter first round seventh round do you expect byron murphy to develop pretty fast to be an impact as early as this season oh he's going to be making an impact in week one he might not be starting right out of the gate but the fact that mike mcdonald was taking him out of games after one series in the preseason that tells you all you need to know this kid already has arrived they know how important he's going to be to their front line most of the time even first round picks you're like i want to get him game action because this sure. is a new level for them yeah, you know, we've seen enough from Byron Murphy, bull rushing guys and blown by dudes on the practice field and, and moving like a running back at defensive tackle. We don't need to see anymore. So I think he is going to be an immediate impact player that NFC West offensive lines are going to hate having to deal with six times a year. Okay. Talk about scheme changes then. Uh, again, uh, Carol here, scheme has been same for a long time. Tweaks here, tweaks there. McDonald comes in, are we looking at a big scheme change or just a little change here or there? And if so, what are those little changes? Honestly, Greg, I don't think that this is going to be a massive schematic change in terms of the types of coverages that you're going to be seeing. There's still going to be an emphasis on press coverage on the outside. I think where you're going to see the differences is the pre-snap disguises and the sim, blitz, the sim pressures. Mike McDonald, actually, the Ravens were in the middle of the pack last year in blitz attempts, blitz percentage. But it felt like they were blitzing all the time because they were using these simulated pressures where they were sending corners, they were sending slot defenders, they were sending nickel safeties, linebackers, and they would drop one of their defensive linemen back. So they're still only sending four, and he is a master at doing that. They have put together some really fun personnel to be able to do those wrinkles. Obviously, Devin Witherspoon last year had three sacks. A rookie is a dynamic blitzer that you can do a lot of fun stuff with. You've got a number of players like Byron Murphy the second that you can move all over the defensive line. There are players like Chenonuosu who you can have go after the quarterback or he can drop back. You've got some linebackers that are excellent blitzers. Jerome Baker, that's been a huge strength for him. Dodson did well last year for Buffalo, getting after the quarterback when he was set. Tyrese Knight had good college production. 
as a blitzer. They've got a lot of really fun pieces. Rayshon Jenkins and Kayvon Wallace can blitz. I mean, this is going to be a defense where you are going to have guys attacking you from every level, every spot in the defense. And it doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to be bringing five plus defenders all the time. They're just going to be mixing up the sim pressures. They're going to show you it's going to be looking like it's a middle of field open and it's going to be field close. They are just masterful at doing that in Mike McDonald's scheme. And I felt like Pete Carroll's scheme just became too vanilla. And when they had the Legion of Boom, they could get away with it because of how amazing that secondary was. But just too often, it was predictable. You knew what they were doing. And opposing quarterbacks, if they're that comfortable, they are going to carve you apart. And so I think that's going to be the biggest difference here schematically is the pre-snap and post-snap changes you're going to see and just the overall aggression, the way that players are going to be moved around like chess pieces with sim pressures. Okay, so let's talk about uh, some uh, some of the rookies, some of the injuries. You mentioned Woso. Uh, he's the only one here in red on defense. Uh, and then just scrolling down uh, and up, uh, he looks like the only one. Uh, that has, is this the case that he is the only one that made the active roster that has some sort of a injury situation? He sprained his knee when he was illegally chop blocked by Brown's guard, Wyatt Teller in the preseason finale he had to exit the game and eventually went to the locker room. John Schneider talked to the media on Wednesday and made it clear that they did not think he was going to end up on injured reserve. They obviously have not done that to this point. And he even didn't rule out the possibility. He didn't know if he'd be ready for week one, but the injury timeline is two to six weeks. The season opener is going to be about three weeks after they played that preseason finale. So it is not out of the question that he could be recovered in time to play in that game. But they have made some moves to help provide some insurance. They just signed Tyus Bowser, who played for McDonald in Baltimore, to their practice squad. And then they also traded for Travis Gibson, who was with the Jaguars in training camp, formerly played for the Bears and the Titans a player that can play multiple positions along the defensive line. So they've added some reinforcements in case Nuosu is not going to be ready, but it sounds like the organization organization's optimistic. That he's not going to miss a ton of time, if any, because of this injury. Okay. Uh, let's take a look at those. Uh, actually, you talked already about a couple of these guys, but uh, what's also, uh, as far as rookies, let's also uh, add in, uh, you've got uh, Tyrese Knight. Uh, you also have Neremiah Pritchett. Those are two uh, fourth and fifth round uh, draft picks. And then D. Williams uh, is a college free agent, uh, the only one on defense. Matter of fact, uh, taking a look at the whole team, uh, he is uh, the only one of two college free agents to make the team the only one on defense. So talk about those rookies. Yeah, I already mentioned with Tyrese Knight, this is a player that put up whopping numbers at UTEP. Had 140 combined tackles last year. <laughs> yeah. The guy knows how to find the football. and. I'm not saying he's the next KJ Wright because I think there's a lot of differences between between him and KJ Wright. I think he's a more athletic player. I think he's more raw in terms of his overall football understanding, playing the position. But he blew up three screens during the preseason that it looked like KJ Wright, who was the screen stopping master. And so you are already seeing some growth. This kid's got top tier athleticism. He can find the football. He's got the ability to drop back in coverage. There's still some work to do there, but he also had really good pass rushing production, four and a half sacks last year for the Miners. I think he is going to play significant snaps for the Seahawks at some point this season. It might not be early in the year, but I think Mike McDonald wants to get him out there. So both Tyrese Knight and Byron Murphy the second, I think those are the two defensive rookies that have a chance, at least on defense, to immediately make an impact. D. Williams is probably not going to be playing on defense with the corner depth the Seahawks have, but where he's going to make a difference, you don't return average almost 15 and a half yards per punt return in the SEC without being a really darn good return specialist. And he showed that throughout the preseason and training camp, an electric player that really fits this new kickoff rule well. And he, he can get after it at corner. There's some aggressiveness. They like what they're seeing development wise there from him. So the big reason he's on this roster, though, is all about the kick and punt returns. This guy is a weapon that has a chance to make a major impact for the Seahawks on special teams. So as far as defensive players making an immediate impact, those three, I think Nehemiah Pritchett right now, he is more of a developmental player that's going to okay. play some special team snaps. But D. Williams has a chance to be a real impact player on special teams. And I think Knight and Murphy are both going to make quite a few contributions for the Seahawks defense as rookies. 
And then taking a look, uh, there are still some young players that need to develop if they're going to make an impact soon. You got Mike Morris from last year's draft. You have um, uh, Mafe uh, from 2022, Derek Hall from last year's draft, and Kobe Bryant from 2022. Are those guys at this point uh, going to be uh, just uh, uh, guys that are going to be part of the rotation, or you like one or two of them, especially Mafe, to make like a significant jump? Well, Mafe made a big sophomore jump last year, nine and a half sacks, just missed double digits. I don't know if he gets back to that number because Draymond Jones is going to be playing more off the edge, but Mafe in this defense with how aggressive they are and the fact that he's been moving around some, they've had him sugaring A gaps, they've had him standing up over B gaps. I mean, they're moving him around. That's something that Pete Carroll staff did not do, and he looks natural at doing it. I think Boy Mafe has a chance to equal his production from last year. The one to keep an eye on is Derek Hall. He had a very quiet rookie year, no sacks, only five quarterback hits, but he has looked like a different player in training camp in the preseason, consistently getting in the backfield. He's blowing up blockers, tight ends, try to kick him out. Good luck. He is knocking guys on their duff. He just looks like a different player. I think Derek Hall has a chance to really make that sophomore leap that we saw from Boy Mafe. Maybe the sack numbers aren't there, but I think Derek Hall is going to add a lot more punch to this defense. And as for a couple of the other players you mentioned, Mike Morris, I think at this point, he's going to be a rotational guy that can play multiple positions, which is a perfect fit in Mike McDonald's defense. He played for him at Michigan in 2021. So he already knew some of this scheme coming in. And Kobe Bryant is probably going to be mostly a special teams guy, though. With Artie Burns being banged up, maybe that ends up being your second slot corner, even though he's been playing safety at this point. He was a slot corner two years ago. They might have to do that out of necessity there are opportunities for him to potentially get on the field on defense as well. I, I would imagine the team is real excited to have Woolen and Witherspoon hopefully together the entire season out there. Uh, that can make a huge difference, as we know. Uh, is Trey Brown considered the question of the secondary, uh, or is he a little bit better than people think? Trey Brown's a really good player. Injuries have held him back his first three seasons in the league, but he had two interceptions last year. He had a pick six in their win over the Detroit Lions. He had an excellent training camp. When they are in nickel packages and they have Devin Witherspoon playing in the slot, Brown is going to be the other boundary corner across from Reek Woolen. That's already been decided. They traded Mike Jackson to Carolina a week and a half ago, so he's not in the mix. Nehemiah Pritchett, I don't think, is ready for that yet. So those are clearly going to be your top three corners that you're going to have with Brown and Woolen being the outside guys. And then Witherspoon and nickel package is going to be playing inside. And they have a few other players that can mix and match, move around. But those are easily their top three corners right now. What I will say from that group, Witherspoon still looks like the real deal after that spectacular rookie season. But Reek Woolen has been the one that last year had kind of a quiet sophomore season. He was dealing with some injuries. He looks like his rookie self, if not better than he was as a rookie. He has had a fantastic training camp in preseason, and I think he is primed for a bounce-back year to potentially be an all-pro candidate on the outside of Mike McDonald's defense. And lastly, uh, Leonard Williams. Uh, of course, that was a, 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 you know an impact trade uh, that uh, I think this is the time that getting accustomed to the team and all that, that – the Seahawks really need the best out of Leonard Williams. Um, what do you think this, the Seahawks defense is going to get out of Williams? Uh, how important is he going to be for them? He is one of the three or four most important players in this entire team because he's going to bring the experience. Maybe he doesn't give you six, seven sacks, but he was extremely disruptive after they traded for him last year. He had double-digit tackles for loss, double-digit quarterback hits, and Greg, he finished fourth on the team in total pressures and only played in 10 games for them after that trade. So that tells you how effective he was in the pass rushing department. He brought leadership. And I think this is a perfect scheme for him because Leonard Williams is not that cookie cutter three tech where that's where you keep him and then you don't move yeah. him around. Like he can go out as a stand up rusher. He can play big end. He can play as an athletic nose. And Mike McDonald is going to take advantage of that. He's going to move this guy all over the formation. They're going to have a number of different packages. They're going to have times where he's going to be playing like a defensive end outside. And then they'll have Jonathan Hankins and Byron Murphy in the inside or Jared Reed playing inside. There's all kinds of fun stuff they can do with him. So you might not see the sack numbers that guys get paid for, but he is going to be disruptive. And I think that this is a guy that the rest of that defensive line feeds off of. 
All right, let's move on over to the offensive side. And, of course, it starts with Gino. So uh, Sam Howell, by the way, um, I, I have no problem at all with Seattle did bringing him over. I mean, that is a really nice backup quarterback to have. Gino uh, is up there in age. He's not uh, Aaron Rodgers' age, but, you know, he's getting up there. But he's still at the prime of his career as far as his talent is concerned. There doesn't seem to be a drop-off. So what do you think about the expectations for Geno Smith this year? I think Geno Smith has a chance to play like a top five quarterback this year. I, I truly believe that this offense, Ryan Grubb, he has come in and look, Geno Smith had some built-in advantages. He had all of his receivers returning. That is certainly going to help when you're learning a new offense. And the fact that he has learned a lot of new offenses in his career, for better or worse, he knew how to handle that. He has been in complete command of this offense since the beginning of OTAs. He looks extremely confident. He's getting the ball out quicker than I've ever seen him do, and he's always had a really quick release. His downfield throws, I mean, that connection he's got with Jackson Smith and Jigba, that, this is the thing I will leave with you, Greg, here today. Jackson Smith and Jigba, if you've seen the hype train, you better jump on it. This kid is ready for a monster sophomore season, and just watching the five snaps that they played against Cleveland in that preseason finale, Geno Smith could put a blindfold on under his helmet and he could complete a 30 yard pass and a slot fade to Jackson Smith and Jigba on his fingertips. These guys, it's almost telepathic right now. And that should be scary for the rest of the league because you still got to deal with DK Metcalf and Tyler Lockett too. But Jackson Smith and Jigba is the ascending star of that receiving core. And Geno Smith loves throwing the football to him. This offense is catered to his ability as a pocket passer that can throw downfield with the best of them and get the football out quick, throw with anticipation and accuracy. So I'm all in on Geno Smith having a huge year in this offense. I think it's a perfect offense for him. By the way, uh, what was the reasoning behind the trade for Sam Howell? Was it just, hey, we can get a guy, starts in the NFL, he's young, we can work with him. Uh, is the hope that he's going to be here for a few years and then maybe take over for Gino? Uh, or do you think this is just a temporary stop and a quality young backup with starting experience? Well, there's a couple factors behind this, Greg. For one, John Schneider and the scouting staff loved Sam Howell coming out of North Carolina a few years ago. They had Drew Locke on the roster, though. He was acquired as part of the Russell Wilson trade. They viewed Drew Locke, who was 25 years old at the time of the trade, they viewed him as their incoming draft pick. He wasn't much older than most of the rookies that were coming in from that draft class. So they ultimately decided not to pick a quarterback, but Sam Howell was very high in their scouting department. They, they loved his toughness. They loved the arm talent, his running ability. They loved the meetings that they had with him in the pre-draft process. So when he became available, John Schneider was looking at this for a couple of reasons. One, I already know what this kid can do. I've seen a full year of film. There's Obviously, he threw a lot of picks, but there's a lot of positives to glean from that full season as a starter in Washington. And two, Seattle was picking 16th. They didn't feel like they were in a position. They didn't have a lot of draft capital. They didn't have a second rounder to try to move up to get a quarterback. So they weren't going to get one of these signal callers that was going early in the draft. And Sam Howell is younger than most of the quarterbacks that got drafted in the first round. He just turned 24. Several of the guys were already 24 before the draft, like Michael Penix and Bo Nix. They were older rookies coming in as part of this draft class. So those were all the reasons behind this. And I think the Seahawks are still looking at this as potentially a situation that Hal could be the successor for Geno Smith. But if Geno Smith goes out and throws 30, 35 touchdowns this year, Sam Howell's going to go in the final year's deal. You're not going to play this year. Geno is still our guy. And so I think it was all about giving themselves options more than anything. Okay. Uh, the backfield, I'm hearing that Kenneth Walker is looking really good, and I'm happy about that since I have him on my dynasty uh, team. So talk a little bit about uh, Kenneth Walker. And, uh, of course, uh, Charbonneau, of course, has done a good job uh, as far as a rookie last year. Uh, but is it possible that Walker is going to be more of a workhorse? You know, it's interesting because if you would have asked me this a month ago, I would have said I'm leaning more towards a by committee 50-50 approach. But there have been some murmurs coming out. New running back coach Kennedy Palomalu, who I'm I'm just saying this based on the last 20 years. I think Kennedy Palomalu was in contention for the best running back coach in the NFL. The work that he's done in Jacksonville when he had Maurice Jones-Drew and Fred Taylor in his career. He had Josh Jacobs run for a rushing title a couple years ago with the Raiders. This guy can flat out coach, and everything I'm hearing is that Kennedy Palomalu 
has been telling Ryan Grubb and the rest of his coaching staff, hey, Ken Walker III has everything to be a superstar workhorse. And if Kennedy Palomalu thinks that, I would trust him because he's had a couple <laughs> rushing title winners. He knows what he's doing. So that has kind of swayed me thinking Charbonnet is going to get his opportunities. But Ken Walker III, if Kennedy Palomalu was saying those kind of things about him, this is a chance to be a really special season with Ken Walker III being more of the workhorse than maybe we originally anticipated with those two second round picks competing against each other. Oh, yeah. Uh, and with his game breaking ability, I think the only thing that with Walker uh, is just to stay healthy. Like a lot of these running backs, he seems yeah. to get banged up here and there, but for the most part, he's been pretty durable. Um, Noah fan. Again, there's talk about, you know, Par Par Parkinson's gone. So there's talk about, well, there's a little bit of an opening and Disley, there's a little bit of an opening here. And is that the opening Noah fans been waiting for? He's been around a while now. Uh, this could be his biggest season. It could be. He's got to show he's healthy. He's missed most of training camp dealing with an undisclosed injury. It sounds like the Seahawks are optimistic. He's going to be back in time for the start of the season, but this offense is catered. What, what people don't remember about Ryan Grubb's offense, like last year, the tight ends were pretty productive. Jack Westover, who unfortunately had a hamstring injury, the Seahawks had signed him and they just had to waive him because he's been injured. But the tight ends were involved more in the passing game than I think people realized the last couple of years for the Huskies and it was a big part of that offense. So I think there is going to be an opening there for Noah Fan, especially with all the attention that Metcalf, Lockett, Smith, and Jigba are going to be drawing from yep. defenses. I just never understood why they couldn't get the ball schemed up to Noah Fant more in that circumstance than they did the last two years. I think Ryan Grubb is the type of coordinator, though, that is going to be able to maximize that. It's just going to boil down to, are you going to have a healthy Noah Fant at the beginning of the season? Because if he's healthy and he's ready to roll, he has been really efficient with his opportunities. They just haven't gotten him the football very much. I expect that to change. I'm not saying he's going to go for 800 yards. There's only one football to go around. But I could see no fan, at least in the red zone, being much more effective after not scoring any touchdowns last season. And then you mentioned uh, Smith and Jigba. Sounds like he's going to have a breakout season. Of course, we know what Metcalf and Lockett can do. So this looks like one of could end up being the best trio of wide receivers in the NFL this season. Uh, the backup situation, you know, we know who these guys are, or at least Bobo and Chenault. You know, those those are the ones that have uh, made a little bit of a name for themselves. Uh, so far in this league, especially Bobo last year. Um, is there anybody out of that out of that uh, threesome there that if something were to happen with one of the starters that you've, you're more comfortable with? Well, I think Bobo is going to be number one in that spot. I, it, look, Greg, everybody keeps waiting for him to fall back to earth because he is not a great athlete. He's <laughs> yeah. not a guy that's going to beat you with speed, and yet – all he does is just go out and make plays. He made the best catch I have ever seen in a training camp practice last month where, I mean, I was next to Ian Rappaport on the sidelines and both of us kind of muttered at the same time, Sam Howell threw the ball. We're like, Oh, that's flying out of bounds. And suddenly here comes Jake Bobo Superman in it reaches out and dives. And you know how difficult those catches are when your hands are extended, arms are extended fully and you can't get your body underneath you to try to hold on to the ball. And he did it. He pulled it off. I mean, this guy just makes play after play. He can block. He does everything the Seahawks ask him to do. But in terms of intrigue, LaVisca Chennault, it was just a totally different skill set than anybody else the Seahawks have. Six foot two, 220 pounds, breaks a lot of tackles. D Eskridge was supposed to be that guy that you could dump off screens to when he could create yardage after contact. LaVisca Chenault is living up to that. He had a fantastic preseason. And I think that he could be a guy that could surprise pe people with how many touches he ends up getting in this offense because he also can be a dynamic runner. He's got 50 carries oh, yeah. in his career. You can run him out of the backfield. You can do jet sweeps. He's got some Corderell Patterson to him in that part of his game. So Chenault would be the one, if you're looking for a deep sleeper in fantasy, just because he can do some things that nobody else in this roster can do. And I think Ryan Grubb's going to try to accentuate that with complimenting the other weapons they've got. He's a guy to keep an eye on. I like that. That would be deep, deep, deep. But chances are he'll be available. So I like that because I, I love Chenault at Colorado. I, I was just so, especially with that, that year that, like you said, he could run, he could return. He is the epitome, in my mind, of what a Heisman Trophy award should be. 
unfortunately it's all been the injuries and that's uh it happens to some players and it sounds like he's healthy uh he's not over the hill yet so he's 25 uh, he's 25 so i think this is a great opportunity and i'm gonna obviously be rooting for him because uh if we can see any bit of what we saw back in college those college days uh maybe he's gonna have that type of season that you're uh, you're implying okay and then let's wrap up the offense with the offensive line so uh, I, I see there that just taking a look at the Arleds board, you've got four rookies uh, that are part of the depth. One is one of those college free agents that made the team in Sundell. Uh, of course, we got the right tackle out, Lucas, but very smart to bring in Fant. And Fant's still playing good football. So oh, yeah. that was a smart move. Yeah, that was one of the smartest moves that John Schneider made because let's face it, I mean, Schneider said the other day that he absolutely expects Abe Lucas to play this year, but all the updates that we continue to get just feel really ominous here. We're talking about a guy that had surgery surgery back in January, and from my understanding, like it wasn't an ACL or anything like that. And here we are now almost into September, and he's still not back yet. And we have no idea when he's going to play. They said they're playing a long-term game here. And I get that. You want to be cautious with knees, particularly for a young player that is one of your building blocks. But George Fant gives them a guy that can start for however long you need. He is a starting caliber player. He has started at left tackle. He started at right tackle. A lot of snaps at both positions. A well-respected veteran leader. And they got some young pieces there. They really like the sixth-rounder, Mike Jarrell, who came out of Finlay University, a Division II school in Ohio. He made the football team out of training camp, a 95th percentile athlete at the tackle position. I, I coached against him in Indianapolis many years ago when he was a sophomore, and he scored a touchdown against my JV defense as a tight end. So this guy is a great athlete. You can see it in the way that he moves, and he had a really good training camp. So he's a player they're looking at long-term, I think, but right now, George Fant bringing him in, that is really an impressive insurance piece, not knowing when or if you're going to get a black, a Lucas back this season. And then talk about the fact that uh, Olo Batimi, there was some talk early on that that was going to be his job, but then they go out and get Connor Williams. I don't think this is an indictment on Olo Batimi as much as it's just an opportunity to go out and get a top five center. I mean, Connor Williams has been a top five center when healthy the last two years. Last season, before he tore his ACL in Miami, he gave up six pressures and a sack in nine games. The guy has been dominant in pass pro. He is a top-tier athlete. Getting to watch him on the practice field a little bit since they signed him, it doesn't look like he's lost that with the injury. He is still a really mobile, athletic guy that gets to the second level. He wins in zone blocking. He's underrated in the power part of the game, too. Can win driving guys off the line of scrimmage. The key with him is health. If he's healthy... Look, top five center, Seattle has not had that since Max Unger was traded many years ago. In fact, they haven't even had a top 20 center for the last 10 years. Getting a guy like this at the pivot position, if he's playing to his capabilities, that has a chance to be a real game changer. And so, again, it's not an indictment on Oluwatimi. Sure. I just think Seattle realized, hey, the ceiling isn't there for him to be a top five center. We can go get one right now at just $6 million in Connor Williams. So they took advantage of that opportunity and signed him. Uh, in wrapping up, uh, are there any other young players that made the roster, you know, the no-name guys that uh, may not be just no-names this year, but guys that you think might contribute even though nobody's expecting it? And that also includes maybe some of the players uh, that could end up on the roster at some point from the practice squad. Well, if we're going to start with the practice squad, I was surprised that they released George Halani, the running back out of Boise State. He had a really good training camp in preseason. Kenny McIntosh played well, too. McIntosh ended up getting that third running back spot. But Halani has a more well-rounded game. He is the better blocker of the two. He is the better overall special teams player of the two. And he runs like a battering ram. Just a totally different style. I see some Thomas Rawls in his game, another former Seahawk undrafted running back that had some success in town. George Halani is going to get his opportunities at some point because running backs get banged up. He is going to get his opportunity. As far as offensive linemen go, Anthony Bradford and Christian Haynes shouldn't be no names because they were mid-round picks, but that is going to be really fun to see how that plays out. They have not named a starter there yet. I expect that Bradford is going to start in week one, but Christian Haynes has looked really good at both guard spots. 
I would not be surprised at some point if he replaces Lake and Tomlinson at left guard and they move forward with two young building blocks at those guard spots. But uh, they've got some really intriguing young players in the interior, which is going to be news to Seahawks fans' ears because they've been playing musical chairs at center and both guard spots for a decade. So it'd be nice to actually have some young guys that they can have some continuity and develop into quality starters. Uh, how are special teams looking? Because you mentioned D. Williams. You got him and you got him and Chanel. I mean, I think those two guys as kick and punt returners are outstanding. Jason Myers, it's an even season. I don't know. I can't understand this, Greg, but he has like a 78% field goal percentage in odd years. And he's almost 91% on even seasons. Yeah. It's 2024. Oh. So Seahawks fans should be feeling really good. He boomed a 58-yard field goal their preseason finale. He missed a couple extra points. In the preseason, he's missed more extra points than any kicker in history, so I don't know what that's all about, but I think he's going to have a good year. And Michael Dixon just consistently year in, year out, is one of the best punters in the NFL. So I think special teams will once again be a strength for this football team. By the way, they picked up uh, uh, Barrett, and I see he's on the practice squad. Yep. So um, is this someone that uh, – because I know he's good in coverage. I- I'm assuming also he should do something on special teams – has the McDonald connection. Is that somebody that has a shot down the line? Yeah, I could see Tyrese Knight and Michael Barrett being their two starters eventually. I think that they're looking at this as Michael Barrett being the Mike, the middle linebacker, and Tyrese Knight being the weak side linebacker and maybe pairing those two together. But they literally traded for Barrett last week, two days before their preseason finale, and he played a little bit of that game, looked lost as understandable. I mean, he hadn't played – He had one practice under his belt going to that preseason game. So I think they want to see more from him and see where he fits. And you have to remember McDonald coached him for one year in 2021, and he played for different coaches the last two years. So there's there's some carryover, but at the same time, uh, this is not, hey, I just coached this guy last season. Yeah. It's been a few years. So they want to see what he brings to the table. But I can see him being a long-term piece at that linebacker spot potentially. So what was that trade, like a conditional kind of deal? Like if uh, They traded like, Mike Jackson for him straight up. Oh, uh, okay. Part of that was Mike Jackson probably wasn't going to make this football team, and that's the depth that Seattle has at corner. All right. So give me – how do you feel? Because I actually – we did a prediction uh, on the season uh, myself, uh, Mark Lawrence from Playbook Experts, and also uh, Ryan Dunleavy of the New York Post. So we did it uh, yesterday, actually, yesterday morning, and I had uh, three teams from the NFC West making it, including Seattle. Uh, because I just think this team is just too talented. I know there are some question marks here and there, but a lot of teams have question marks, including the ones that you, that are considered, you know, maybe that five, six, seven uh, position uh, making the playoffs as wild card type uh, uh, teams. Uh, but I just think they're just too talented to not find a way to be there at the end. And then it just comes down to injuries probably. It really boils down to the defense. If this is a, 15th or 16th ranked scoring defense instead of 25th with the weapons that the Seahawks have on offense, what I believe is going to at least be a marginally better offensive line, if not significantly better. Connor Williams could make that a big difference. That's the kind of player that he is at the center position. But I think double digit wins or bust for this football team this year. And I know that's a lot of pressure to put on a first year head coach, but Mike McDonald did not inherit a rebuilding team. He inherited a team that's got a lot of really fun young pieces. They've got some good experienced veterans on both sides of the ball. They've got a quarterback that I think is still very underrated because of his story. I just think there are some people that will never overlook the fact that Geno Smith was a bust for seven years, was a backup, and then he suddenly turned it around. I think Geno Smith's going to have a big season as long as they can stay healthy this is going to be a really tough division, but I, I think it's 10 wins or more or bust. And I still think it's San Francisco's division, but I think Seattle could make it interesting, especially if that defense ends up being a top 15 unit and the offense is humming. Hey, this team has the pieces to make things interesting with San Francisco. There's no question about it. Corbin, uh, great job as always. I appreciate uh, your time. Uh, again, locked on Seahawks and Seahawks Maven. Is that still? No, we're now Seahawks on SI. We uh, we rebranded, which is honestly much easier, <laughs> much easier for people to remember. So Seahawks on SI, excellent. And then they can also catch you like streaming services, YouTube and such. YouTube, you can get podcast our locked on podcast five plus days a week. Regular season, we're we're doing six or seven shows. You can get on any podcast platform. 
for free. Just subscribe and get all our articles on Seahawks on SI. I'm going to do some work with Fox 13 this year on, on Monday nights, um, doing some TV work as well. Oh, so cool. it's going to be a really busy season coming up here. Excellent. I'm glad to hear that, Corbin. I also hear that you're heading back to Seattle. <laughs> We're planning to, yeah. So good luck with that. And uh, yeah, that's uh, that would be great news, of course. Get closer to the team and all that. And uh, best of luck this season. Again, I appreciate it. I look forward to talking to you during the season. Sounds good, Greg. Take care, man.